So, I'm Alessandro Mazzarotti, and uh, I am a professor of physics and astronomy at our uh, college, obviously. And uh, we're going to present about this uh, wonderful eclipse that is going to happen tomorrow, and about another one that is going to be even more consequential early next year, in April next year. So, um, I do astronomy and I do physics, both of them actually, for my research. That's rather than a chair of my department. Um, I'm Francesca Fornesini. I'm also a professor in the physics astronomy department. Um, my research is mostly on black holes, so I like dark things. Um, and um, yes, so we're going to be telling you about solar eclipses. Um, and the very exciting thing is that there's two of them that are coming up in this year um, to the skies near you. So let me, oh, let me do it for you. Um, so the first is, as I mentioned, happening tomorrow, um, October 14th, and um, in some places of the country it's going to be what's called an annular eclipse. So this is when the moon does not completely block out the surface of the sun, um, but you still see a thin uh, ring of light um, coming from the sun. Um, so this is an image from the annular eclipse that happened almost a decade ago now. Uh, and this annual eclipse is actually going to happen uh, to be visible in the way that you saw the previous picture. You're going to have to go to Oregon all the way down to Texas in between about 9 a.m. in the morning Pacific time all the way to about noon in Texas time, central time here, in order to actually see it uh, the way that you saw the previous picture. We are not going to be as lucky because the path is going to be uh, farther away from where you see the annularity. Rather right here, you're going to see something like this. You're going to see a partial eclipse. So it's less prominent, less beautiful, but still, it's something that happens not very often. And this is actually the way it's going to look like. It's going to be 20% of the sun is going to be eaten away by the moon for a short amount of time. And uh, obviously, you, you can try to look at it with your eyes without any protection. It's going to be bad for you. So I urge you to use some devices of all the kind that you're going to be giving here today. Um, so eclipses, solar eclipses, have been recorded since ancient history um, from different parts throughout the world. Um, and they've become very much a part of the um, mythology um, of different cultures. So this is just an example um, here on the right. This is from a Norse myth. Um, about this mythical wolf um, that chases the sun, um, trying to eat her, and um, that was kind of how they uh, came to explain <coughs> mythically um, what happens during solar eclipses. Um, um, and um, uh, the Mayans in particular um, kept very detailed records of astronomical events. Um, and based on astronomical records that they were keeping in the 11th and 12th centuries, they were, for example, able to predict the time that a solar eclipse happened in July 1991 over Central America, where the Mayans lived, um, within the accuracy of a day. Okay? Um, records of eclipses dating to about 1200 um, BCE um, from China um, were used um, relatively recently to actually determine how um, Earth's rotation, so its spin during a single day, um, has slowed down over time. And it's a very small amount, okay? So over the past 3,200 years, it's slowed down just by 0 0.047 um, seconds per day. Uh, but this sort of measurement has really been enabled just by the fact that solar eclipses are just this very striking, um, awe-inspiring phenomenon and that we have these records um, that date back um, so long. So what actually causes eclipses? Um, and here I want to distinguish between solar eclipses, which are the bulk of the talk that we're talking about, and lunar eclipses that you may have also heard about and, and maybe even seen. Um, so both um, are related to the orientation of the sun, the earth, and the moon. And they all have to do with the casting of shadows. 
So in the case of a lunar eclipse, um, what we see is the shadow of the sun um, onto the moon. And this is when the moon can appear um, a very reddish um, color. Um, that reddish color is actually um, resulting from um, the sunlight that goes through um, our atmosphere, sort of similar to how the colors um, of the sunlight during sunset appear that sort of reddish color. Um, solar eclipses, which are the bulk of what we're talking about today, are due to when the moon is casting its shadow onto the Earth. Okay? And there is a region of um, this complete shadow that's called the umbra. Um, it's about 70 to 100 kilometers wide. Okay? And that's what's typically called the path of totality. That is the width of the area in which you need to be um, in order to be able to actually see either the angular eclipse or the total eclipse of the sun. Um, there's this larger region called the penumbra um, in which light from the sun is only partially obscured, partially shadowed by the moon. Um, and this is, for example, where east it is um, with regards to the eclipse that's happening tomorrow. We're going to be in the penumbra, so only part of the light from the sun is actually going to be um, eclipsed and shadowed by the moon. Um, the fact that solar eclipses um, happen at all and that we have um, the remarkable opportunity to witness them from Earth is a really fortunate and lucky coincidence. Um, it just so happens that because of the relative size of the sun, the size of the moon, and their distances from us, the apparent size of the moon and the apparent size of the sun are basically identical when we look at them in the sky. Okay? Um, if the moon was just a bit closer to us, it would never be sort of, sorry, if it was just a bit farther from us, it would never be big enough to actually cover um, the surface of the sun, and we would never be able to see um, these total eclipses. Um, um, so um, the eclipse that's happening um, tomorrow is what we call an angular eclipse, which again means that there's going to be just a little bit of a remaining ring of light from the surface of the sun that's actually still peeking through from behind the moon. Um, a total eclipse is when the surface of the moon completely blocks the light that is coming from the surface of the sun. And there will be a total eclipse that's happening over North America um, in the spring, okay, on April 8th. And we'll talk about the details of that a little bit later. So the reason why not all eclipses are total eclipses is that the moon, um, on its orbit around the Earth, there are times when it's a little bit closer and a little bit farther from the Earth. And so you may have also heard sometimes you'll see it like splashed on some um, news sites like super moon happening tonight. Um, so a super moon happens when um, the moon is a little bit closer to Earth than it is on average, okay? And in that case, it appears kind of like 14% bigger than when it's at its farthest point um, from, um, from the Earth, okay? So total eclipses um, occur when the moon is basically close enough to us that it appears large enough to actually fully block out the sun, when the moon is a little bit farther away, then we get um, an angular eclipse, like we're getting tomorrow. So in fact, uh, it so happens that whenever you have an eclipse of the sun, in which you have an annular eclipse, which is the moon is a little farther away, it doesn't cover completely the sun. When you have a full moon on the other side, when the moon goes around, circle around the Earth, and it finds itself to be a full, then at that point, the moon is going to be a super moon, because it's going to be closer to us, while here it's farther away. You see? Because the orbit of the moon is actually an ellipse, slightly elliptical, means that sometimes it's getting closer to us and sometimes farther away. And now, when you're looking at the eclipse tomorrow, the moon is going to be farther away, but then it's going to be closer to us on the other side when you get a full moon. So the full moon that you're going to see two weeks from now is going to be quite a big one. It's a super moon. So the two are related to each other. But then the question is the following. When you have eclipses, they happen when? They happen, say, that the Earth is here and the Sun is here. 
the eclipses of the sun happen whenever the moon finds itself in the path of the light coming from the sun. In other words, it comes exactly in the, in the earth of the sun. And therefore, if you wait one entire moon, a month, the moon should go back to the same place, and therefore you should have an eclipse of the same eclipse. But you don't. Why is that the case? Why is it not every month that you have a lunar eclipse on this side or a solar eclipse on the other side? And the reason for that is because the orbit of the moon around the Earth is not perfectly on the same plane as our orbit of the Earth around the sun. The two not being exactly in the same plane makes it impossible for the moon to be perfectly aligned to give us always eclipses. You see? Instead, the moon has a little bit of a tail to it, but something like five degrees. And you can see here. So when you have a new moon, often, the moon is going to be just above the sun and therefore totally invisible in the glare of the day. It's there, but you can't see it, because it's not passing right in front of the sun. In this case, we are lucky. We are lucky that we are in that part of the orbit, which actually is, next slide, corresponds to what we call the line of nodes, in which the moon really can come exactly in the path of the sun. And that happens only two points here and here, which means only two times in a year you're going to have the opportunity, maybe, to see the kids. And sometimes it happens, and sometimes it does not happen. The moon is easier. To have a lunar eclipse, it's easier to have an eclipse of the sun. The eclipse of the sun is a more fine-tuned kind of event, so it is more rare. And it is uh, even more rare, even rarer, you may say, because we are talking about the path of totality being so short, so small, on the surface of the moon. So you have to be really lucky to see a total eclipse of the sun. While, of course, when you see the moon being eclipsed of the Earth, all over the globe, you're going to be able to see such an eclipse. You see? So it's a, it could be easier and more frequent. It's still beautiful. It's a different kind of eclipse. So I think it's, yeah. Um, so I want to just walk you through kind of the, the phases of an eclipse and what you can expect to see um, if you actually go to see um, an annular or total eclipse. Um, so the longest part of the eclipse, which lasts sort of like a few um, couple of hours um, is what we call the partial eclipse. So this is when progressively over time, more and more of the moon starts to shadow the sun and it looks like the sun becomes more and more of like a crescent shape, okay? Um, during this period, you must use protective um, uh, eyewear, your eclipse glasses or sun oculars. <coughs> or make use of what are called pinhole cameras to actually see the image of the sun. It is not safe to look at it with um, your naked eye. Um, and I have, if you click, there's um, a couple images. So this is an image of a pinhole camera. It's a very simple device. It basically consists of just like a little hole, okay? And a piece of paper, some sort of plane to actually project an image on. And in fact, they are so, such simple devices that you can use some everyday objects that become natural pinhole cameras, um, just sort of out in nature. So um, during a partial eclipse, you want to pay attention to shadows. Um, one really nice example of sort of a natural pinhole camera is leaves on trees. So if you look at the light that is filtering through the leaves on the trees, during a partial eclipse, you'll actually see a bunch of little images of effectively the crescent sun um, displayed um, on the shadows. Um, when I went to um, see a total solar eclipse um, a few years ago in 2017, another very common object to use was a colander because it's effectively like a pinhole camera. It's a bunch of, you know, it's an object with a bunch of ready-made holes in it. Um, um, and um, so if you have just like a colander with you outside, um, hold it in the sun, and you'll see that the shadow is no longer these round perfect, perfect circular holes, but instead a series of little images of the partial eclipse. So um, when, um, during the phase where you're approaching um, totality, so either just before or just after totality, um, 
you'll start to see um, some interesting features um, appear. Um, and this should still be while you're wearing your um, glasses, okay? Safety glasses or looking through some sort of, sort of filter. So as the um, eclipse is approaching totality, um, and sometimes you see these during an annular eclipse, but it's most common during a total eclipse, you'll sometimes see what are referred to as Bailey's beads, these small little sort of like round specks of light. Um, and these are due to the fact that the moon's surface is not perfectly flat, right? It has craters and ridges and valleys. And so in those little craters and valleys, there's still a little bit of sunlight from the sun's surface peeking through, even when instead the rest has been um, already shadowed and obscured by the moon. Okay. So these are Bailey's beads. Another effect as you get even closer to um, totality um, is um, the diamond ring effect. So this is basically usually due to the very last basically crater valley um, that is on that particular um, sort of side of the moon, the last through which the sun is still visible. Um, and at that point, you are able to see the corona, which is the outer atmosphere of the sun. You're able to see the corona kind of forming this ring and then what's called kind of the diamond on the edge of the ring, which is basically that last um, Bailey speed um, before um, the total eclipse really occurs. Um, and the other features that are visible at this time is what are called solar prominences or even solar flares or solar eruptions. And these will appear reddish um, around um, the uh, surface of the sun. Um, these are associated with the sun's magnetic activity. They are regions where um, the magnetic field of the sun basically is forming these, these loops. And there are particles from the sun's surface that travel around those loops. Um, and in some cases, they can also lead to eruptions, in which case you tend to see larger, um, kind of bigger structures um, off the surface of the sun. And so what you see there is what you can do whenever you're looking at these little prominences, these little spots at the very edge of the sun during an eclipse. You can actually take a so-called spectrum. You can put something like a, you know, a prism or one of these other devices you can use with a telescope to break the light in different colors. And what it looks like is a spectrum with lines, particular colors only. And that's what happens to a transparent gas whenever you are taking individual atoms and you are exciting them into producing light. It's called fluorescence, just like in fluorescent lights in, in, in the roots, right? And the, one of the biggest important lines that you see is very red in color, which if you remember the previous slide, is the main color that you see in these eruptions from the sun. That's hydrogen, which is 75% of the total mass of the sun is in this particular element, which is more rare, obviously, on Earth. It forms the oceans through the water, but other than that, the Earth is not made of hydrogen. But the rest of the cosmos is, and the sun is made of hydrogen for the most part. And that's what you see when you're looking directly at these parts of the atmosphere of the sun. To me, you can see that very, very well. So, the next slide, we're Finally, um, if you actually do travel to the path of totality so that you're able to see um, a total solar eclipse, then there are a series of very particular, unusual, and surreal things that start to happen. And in fact, I strongly recommend, given that April's um, total solar eclipse is going to be relatively close to us, it's going to go through, the path of totality is going to go through northern New Hampshire and northern Vermont. This is one of those events that I recommend at least once in a lifetime if you go and you see. Um, because it's just absolutely awe-inspiring. So um, some of the strange things that you'll notice um, once totality occurs, and totality typically occurs, lasts about three minutes, okay? So you have three minutes of time to kind of like really take in this experience. Um, one is that you, um, if you look towards the horizon, you'll see a 360 degree sunset, okay? So we're used to having like sunset happening 
you know, to the west, just in the direction of the sun, or dawn to the east. In this case, you see a sunset that's 360 degrees all the way around. So in fact, if you're able to be in a location where you have a good, clear view of the horizon around, that's kind of a really nice place um, to view um, the solar eclipse. Um, and that is because what you're seeing at the edges of the horizon is those parts outside of the path of totality where there is sunlight, some sunlight, that is reaching um, those parts of the sky. Um, if you look up at um, the sun itself, of course, this is when you'll now see the corona. So that's the outer atmosphere of the sun. We'll talk about it in more detail in a little bit. And um, it always, it's a constantly changing and evolving thing. So the corona does not look the same from one total eclipse to the next, okay? It's ever evolving um, and um, it has this sort of like wispy-like um, structures that are again connected to um, the magnetic field, the magnetic activity of the sun. Um, you also notice as totality is approaching, but especially during totality, that the temperature really drops. And in fact, often, not only is there a temperature drop, but there's really like a significant breeze um, that you start to feel. Um, and that's the result of the fact that there is just this particularly sort of like narrow corridor, 100 mile mark corridor, where all of a sudden there is no light coming from the sun. And that creates this temperature differential and um, this kind of breeze that picks up. If you look around the sun at other parts of the sky, you'll be able to see some bright stars and planets. So you'll simultaneously be seeing the sun, the moon in front of it, and um, the stars and other planets in our solar system in the night sky, um, which is just a very um, unique thing. So totality is the only time when it's safe to look at the sun directly with your eyes, without any sort of filters in between. So even if you go and travel to see the annular eclipse, even once the eclipse reaches its maximum and you have that annular eclipse, you still actually need to wear safety glasses because even that small little surface of the sun that is still visible, is still enough light to actually damage the eyes. So it's only when you're in the path of totality during a uh, total solar eclipse that you're actually able to look at the sun directly, and it is at that point completely safe. So that applies to the eclipse on April 8th, because if you are uh, not going to go the hours by car, north to places like Berlin or the Adirondacks or Rochester or places like this. And if you stay here, you're going to see almost the total eclipse. You're going to see something like 90% of the sun obscured. But then again, because it's 90%, it's not 100%. You really shouldn't look up, even then, without any protection. Because you're going to see a crescent, the sun that, you know, that remains like a crescent, but that crescent is going to shine really bright. But of course, all around you, it will look a lot darker than normal. For sure. So that is going to be very interesting. Even though you're not exactly in totality, you're still going to see some of the effects that Francesca is talking about. Now, of course, if you are uh, lucky enough to see the totality, then uh, you can see details that normally escape inside. Because uh, during a total eclipse of the sun, uh, the sun will appear dark. So it will appear in the same manner as you were in orbit, away from the atmosphere, no glare. Uh, coming from the sun, and especially no blue sky, because now you're in the dark. So that's why you can see details that otherwise would be exactly the same if you were in orbit on the Earth. You could see from from the orbit of the planet, you could actually look at the corona. That's what people do when they're on the space station, when they're up in space. And at the same time, if you are in, uh, you know, in a situation like uh, in space without an atmosphere, you can see 360 degrees all around you. You can see the sun as well as all the planets and stars all around you. In the same manner to the solar sort of eclipse. So you're lucky that you can do that within the atmosphere of the planet the total eclipse. And only for three minutes. So you're having a little bit of a view like people would have if they're in space. 
In particular, as you can see here, the corona. These wisps here don't look random, and they are. What happens is that the sun is surrounded by an atmosphere, which is at an enormous temperature, millions of degrees. And so, therefore, the, the particles of the atmosphere, the various atoms, are stripped of their own electrons, and they become particles that are charged. You know, the nuclei of atoms are positive, the electrons are negative, and they move independently because they are separated from each other. But when you have charged particles in a magnetic field, like the sun is a very strong one, then these particles are going to spiral in the magnetic field lines, and they're going to create these wisps that you can see here that are tracing a little bit like the fines of iron, you know, when you have a magnet. They're tracing the magnetic field of the sun. And that really is very similar to the <laughs> hair you can see down here, right? Uh, that is that you probably instead of electrostatic forces when you go to the Museum of Science, right? That you do the hair like that and put it in your hand on something you let it out. No, that's simply because he liked the hair do that, right? But it kind of resembles that, right? So what you see here, and you actually don't see it, but you know that it's coming because you can see the effects of it, is that these kind of uh, magnetic fields generate streams of particles coming from the sun and ejected into space, eventually reaching the Earth as a solar wind. And the solar wind is important for people to interact communications because when you have a satellite out there, it's subject, uh, if it is far enough from the Earth and not protected by our own magnetic field, these particles coming to these satellites can actually impede communication. We can even fry the circuits of these machines. So we, uh, people who do engineering, aerospace engineering, really are very careful about the effects of the sun on our own devices out in space. So that's uh, what I needed to tell you about this slide. We go to the next one. And here is something important about Einstein's theory of relativity. Einstein theorized at some point, early, more than a century ago now, early in the 20th century, that space is being curved by the presence of matter. So in particular, imagine a mass like the sun. It will curve space all around it. But if you curve space, you can actually deviate light in a curved space, which is what he then, as a consequence of his theory, he actually calculated. What it means basically is that you can do what is called a gravitational lensing. The sun is a gravity lens, and anything behind it, any starlight coming from behind it, can be actually lensed and become bigger as fat, like a lens would do. And this kind of effect was theorized by him. And in fact, just at the eve of the First World War, he actually took his friends and he tried to travel where a total eclipse was going to happen in Romania. And he was caught in the beginning of the First World War and incarcerated for a few days before being expelled from Romania, which I think was allowed with Russia and against Germany. He's a German, right? Which Einstein was. And so he ended up barely making it away from this, and he couldn't see the eclipse, unfortunately. A few years later, however, after the First World War was over, uh, the first uh, solar eclipse was seen in order to find this kind of effect, the lens, the seeing that you, since you can see stars during an eclipse behind the star, behind the sun, actually you can see that they are shifting compared to their normal position because the sun is lensing and it's making everything bigger. And that kind of effect was noticed for the first time in 1919. Mm -hmm. And it was the very first real proof of relativity. And it was a very important thing. Since then, of course, many times it was redone. And many other proofs came for relativity. But that was the very first time. So you can see that eclipses can actually do a lot of relativity business. Um, and one last example of science um, that is being done sort of currently during eclipses um, is studies of the ionosphere. So uh, Earth's atmosphere has different layers with different properties. There is a particular um, sort of outer layer of Earth's atmosphere called the ionosphere. Um, the word ion here is, uh, refers to the charged particles um, that are actually primarily ionized by sunlight um, coming from the sun. And um, the ionosphere is extremely important for a couple reasons. One is that it can actually bounce low frequency light. So for example, radio communications, um, radio stations use the ionosphere to bounce um, signals and effectively allow those signals to travel farther um, around the Earth than they otherwise could were the ionosphere not there. 
Um, it's also where a lot of low Earth orbit satellites um, are actually in orbit around the Earth. Um, and so understanding the properties of the ionosphere is important also um, because it can impact um, those satellites, many of which are related to GPS and like communications. Um, and during an eclipse, because the moon casts this shadow in a very localized part of the ionosphere for a short period of time, there are changes that happen to the ionosphere because the sunlight is blocked just in this area for a small amount of time. And so there are actually a couple of so-called citizen science projects um, where if you either have like a ham radio or um, this group, Radio Jovi, will actually um, send you um, the tools that you need to build a very um, simple rudimentary radio telescope. Um, you can basically take data during the eclipse um, and contributed to this effort to learn more about the ionosphere and the changes that happen to it um, when um, the sunlight is blocked um, during the eclipse. Um, so I just wanted to end here with kind of like key information about the upcoming um, solar eclipses um, and specifically kind of with reference to Easton. Um, so the eclipse happening, oh, this should be October 14th. I'm so sorry. So the eclipse happening tomorrow, October 14th. Um, if you're here in um, Easton, the partial eclipse is going to begin around 12.20 p.m. So that is the time when you can go outside with your sun oculars, with your eclipse glasses, or with your pinhole cameras, okay, and actually start seeing the sun take on more of this crescent shape. Um, the maximum from here locally will appear around 1.26 p.m. And that is when about 20% of the sun's surface will be covered by the moon. So that is when you'll see the largest effect. Um, you probably will not notice anything happening here otherwise because it is such a small fraction um, here in Houston. And then the eclipse here will end around 2.35 p.m. So that's kind of the time window if you actually want to see, um, see it tomorrow. Um, the total solar eclipse that's happening in April 8, um, in 2024, um, the path is sort of shown here. And you can see it's off the screen. But it goes through um, Vermont, uh, northern Vermont and northern New Hampshire. Um, and so like I said, um, I would seriously consider planning a trip and going and seeing this like awe-inspiring event for yourself. Um, eclipses, total solar eclipses, only happen in the same region of Earth about once every 400 years on average. So the fact that it's happening relatively close to us is pretty much a once in a lifetime type of event. Um, I was lucky enough to see a total solar eclipse in um, Idaho, actually in 2017. Um, and I can guarantee it's like, it's not an overhyped thing. Um, and especially wherever you go, there tend to be throngs of people because again, the path is only about 100 miles wide and a lot of people go to see it. Um, and it's an amazing also communal experience. When totality happens, there are just like shouts and screams and everyone's excited and clapping. And um, it's just surreal and like nothing else really that you can experience. So I would really consider actually making the trip um, and going and seeing it. Um, if you stay locally, though, the maximum eclipse that's happening on April 8th will have 90% coverage of the sun. And that'll happen around 3.30 PM that day. Um, and you will see a lot of the effects that I talk about. You'll notice a general dimming of the light, even though it won't be quite as dramatic as if you're in the path of totality. Shadows will look weird. You'll see all those crescent shape if you're looking you know, at light filtering through the leaves and stuff like that. So there will be noticeable effects um, during the April 8th eclipse. Um, but I really recommend to try, try and go, OK? Um, and if you want more information, just click the last thing. Um, there's a couple of website here, websites here um, that provide both additional information also a series of like free eclipse apps um, for things like finding out 
when you're in the path of totality. So if you're driving in your car on April 8th and you're like, am I there? Have I gone far enough yet? Um, there are um, apps like that for your phone that will actually help you. Um, okay. When you see a traffic jam, you, you, you're probably close to the eclipse. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There will probably be a lot of traffic and a lot of congestion, so just plan ahead. Um, and also, safe solar eclipse viewers, um, if you want 